So hello um, everyone and um, thank you for having me this evening and um, coming to listen to my talk um, and thank you for the introduction. As Amy said, um, my name is Frank Coles and I'm the Conservation Documentation Manager for Bristol Culture and Creative Industries, which is part of uh, Bristol City Council. So as a brief introduction to the department um, and, and where, I, you know, where I work, Bristol uh, Culture manages five museum sites and the city archive. The conservation and documentation team consists of four conservators covering paper, paintings, objects and preventive conservation. And then we have three and a half full-time documentation specialists as well. So I have managed the team since the two departments were merged five years ago. And as I said, my background is as a preventive conservator after training in objects conservation at Cardiff. So the BLM protests and the toppling of the Edward Colston statue marked a significant moment in our history as a city. During this talk, I will focus on the practical aspects of documenting and treating objects from the protests during a lockdown, including how the team worked to preserve objects with limited access to equipment, materials, and some of our staff. I will also touch on the challenges and opportunities that we have that have arisen from working on this project. Oh, now it's not working. Interesting. Ah, that's okay then. Um, Lockdown has been a challenging time for all of us as a sector. So I did think I would just share a little bit about the situation we found ourselves in, in case it was of interest. Um, so firstly, unlike many museums, because we're part of the council, we weren't furloughed. Uh, so this meant we were able to continue as much work as we could remotely, including on-site activities that were deemed sort of essential. So um, although we weren't furloughed, two members of my team were redeployed to other council departments. So they were redeployed to help with community initiatives, coordinating volunteers who were helping those um, vulnerable people who were shielding within the city that needed help. Uh, the essential collections care activities that did continue throughout lockdown were pest checks and environmental monitoring at our sites, condition checks of our temporary exhibition loans, uh, we did um, some remobilization planning at all our sites and we also undertook supervision of contractors during essential maintenance. So pictured here is uh, the roof of one of our historic house museums, Georgian House. Uh, it needed some really quite essential emergency repair work to its roof. So um, our preventive conservator spent a few, quite a few weeks supervising the contractors there. We spent some initial time communicating with external uh, stakeholders in the first couple of weeks, liaising with lenders about how we were continuing to look after their objects, liaising with borrowers about our objects, looking at extensions, delays, and when we might be able to see things return to us. Just recently, we completed our first virtual de-rig um, as the museum in Italy needed to return our objects. This was a very interesting experience, which I can share after this with anyone who's interested. Although I didn't partake of it myself, both our registrar and our paper conservator were involved and um, it was certainly quite an eye-opening experience for them. So the majority of our work though centred on our collections management system. So initially that was dealing with our own paperwork backlogs, um, but then we moved on to digitalising sort of 30 years worth of uh, paper conservation records that kept them busy for a while. Um, and supporting other teams with information from our collections management system, EMU. Quite a lot of our colleagues didn't have access to the, our network. So we were, those of us that did have networked laptops were able to support them with images, information, files, etc. cetera. Um, well, um, once homeworking got a bit more challenging for the conservators, our documentation officer, Linda, got us all adding keywords, um, key search words into the description field on EMU to improve online searchability, searchability, which was of particular importance as the public could only now access our collections through this online portal. And one of the things we found was that there was certain, certain collections where those sort of key obvious terms that someone might use to search for, for an object just weren't there in the description field. So we were gradually adding those um, as a job we could do from home. 
So lockdown certainly had its ups and downs alongside challenges that I'm sure have been echoed across the country. Um, a lack of networked IT equipment, as I mentioned, was, was a particular issue for our documentation team. I spent a significant amount of time grappling with which method of information sharing we should use when not all the team had access to our network and we had a range of technical ability within the team. It was Im so important that the team felt connected and could continue to work from home. So we set up regular daily coffee break Zooms where people could chat and gossip as well as catch up on work. Um, and these weren't mandatory, people dipped in and out, but it was a way of us staying in contact. Um, although some people did have challenges with their home internet. So one of my team did have to occasionally go and stand in a field to actually chat with us, um, which I, I, I admire her kind of dedication to the cause of coffee. Um, so juggling family commitments has also been a challenge as everyone has, has, has found. Um, but I for one did, definitely did not miss my calling as a teacher. I'm quite glad they've gone back to school. So there have been a, a number of major events over the last year which have really driven our contemporary collecting in Bristol and it allowed us to record the mood and voices of the city. There's my cat in the background, sorry. But from the Extinction Rebellion protests, COVID-19 and the city's response to lockdown through to the BLM protests, Watching the news coverage on that day, I was really aware that it was likely that the team would be asked to support the conservation and documentation of the items from the protests as part of that contemporary collecting programme. So the first call we got was to help retrieve bin bags full of placards and banners that had been deposited at City Hall after they had been cleared from the protest site. With rain on the Sunday, it was clear that there would be some conservation required to ensure the placards from the protest could be preserved. Our head of collections had retrieved a few that afternoon, but the majority were bagged up and taken to City Hall. A colleague kindly brought the modern records van over, at, uh, over on the Monday morning and they were brought then over to Emshed. This had to be done in a COVID secure way, which added to the challenges, particularly as this was the, um, particularly as we had all been working from home for the past three months. So it was the first time we'd really had to put in place new risk assessments and ensuring that we were working in a secure, a COVID secure way. So we were very lucky that Ellie, our paper conservator, and Linda, our documentation officer, were able to come to, into MSHED to support the curator Amber assess and document the objects. Treatment wise, uh, the priority was, was getting them dry as quickly as possible to stop the cardboard from disintegrating or the sellotape from peeling off because there was quite a lot and to prevent a mold outbreak. They were already quite smelly. So we had to improvise with what we had to hand. They were propped with, um, they propped the placards against chairs and used paper towels to absorb moisture from particularly saturated examples. Ellie also used the paper drying rack that is is used for our public printing workshops, uh, which is luckily kept in the store next door. We couldn't use fans in the way that we might usually do because of the COVID guidance. So we naturally ventilated the space as much as possible by opening windows and doors. As this was being done, the placards were also photographed and catalogued to ensure we were able to document the significant day in the city's history. In total, the team dried and documented over 550 placards over two days. Once all the placards had been propped up to dry, it really was quite moving. Um, and it, it just illustrated just how powerful the messages are when seen all together um, on the day itself when they sent the photos around. It, it, it really was something to be seen. So then came the decision from the mayor's office that the statue of Edward Colson would be removed from the harbour and needed to be stored securely and stabilised. I should say at this point that the city's public art does not normally fall within our remit. We will often provide advice and support, but they are not accession museum objects and do not form part of our collections. So as with the placards, we got a call. Um, and I should also say now, as, as I've said, I'm, you know, I'm a preventive conservator. Uh, I, 
many moons ago did do objects conservation, but I'm not a sculpture conservator. Um, and I was really the team member who was most easily available at the time when it was difficult to travel and we were all balancing work with home commitments and health concerns. So I was really sort of just the person that was there to be able to do this. So after a very early start, myself and then Linda, our documentation officer, arrived at the harbour to document the removal of the statue and ensure all the material that came up with the statue was kept. Um, as, as, they, as the craners lifted it up and then placed it onto the barge, um, they were quite keen to sort of take the ropes off and, and, um, and clean them up for us. And we had to definitely sort of say, no, don't worry, we, we can do that all um, at, at the other end. So we only had a short amount of time to prepare for the statue's arrival. Um, neither our object or preventive conservators were able to come into Bristol. So they briefed me on the most appropriate way to reduce any further deterioration while ensuring we preserve the new additions and the damage that occurred on its journey from the plinth to the harbour. Having been home for such an extended period without access to the conservation studio, I arrived with an impromptu and slightly uh, unusual cleaning pack. So I found some microfiber cloths, which actually didn't turn out to be much use. Um, uh, a couple of sponges and my trusty kitchen brush which managed to make it into all the photos which was a bit embarrassing um, and I should say that I didn't actually use it that much it was just the things that I had to hand that I felt like I needed to take with me um, to feel slightly more prepared than I um, otherwise would have been. Um, luckily the store we were in had water supply and we were also able to find me some waders which was very I was very grateful for and in addition, um, an adjustable brush that we were able to use uh, to clean inside the statue. Uh, with the notice we had, it was quite hard to think of how to support him. So we managed to find some, source some pallets to rest the statue on and keep it off the floor to help drying, but also access while I was cleaning the statue. Once the statue had been uh, delivered to the secure store, I was able to assess it for damage and undertake the first of what will be a number of stabilisation stages. After discussions with Amelie, our object specialist, we decided that the mud and residues from the harbour could put the statue at risk of long-term instability because despite only being in the water for a few days, the mud had filled the insides of the statue and obscured the evidence of what had happened during its journey into the harbour. We spent the morning removing mud from its insides with a hose and extendable brush and gently washing the outside surfaces. The loss of one of the coattails actually aided this as it revealed a hole in the statue's side that appears to have been created as part of the casting process and allowed us to better access uh, to remove the mud. The painted graffiti was particularly at risk from the cleaning so this was done very carefully to ensure it wasn't washed off. I was lucky to have colleagues on site to help document and move the statue as I cleaned. The painted areas were very fragile, as I've said. Even a small amount of running water caused flakes to come away from the surface. So I left these areas as much as I could, as I just didn't have the right equipment or time to do this safely. A rope that was used to topple the statue, which you can see in one of these images, was still attached to the base, but it was heavily frayed and at risk of being lost. So I documented the location and knot type before removing the rope and then allowing it to dry separately. Once everything is dry, this will be returned to the statue. After the initial clean, it was over a week before we were actually able to enter the building again to check on the progress of the drying. Um, again, this was me, I, I, I was the one that was able to go in. So on examination, we discovered that both the paint and a layer below this was starting to lift and flake from the bronze surface. All the public sculptures are regularly maintained by the council and have protective wax coatings applied. Um, here it seems that the wax layer has become brittle and started to deteriorate. Again, a phone call to our object conservator was made. A subsequently a tent constructed out of things we've sort of managed to cobble together to try and slow the surface drying. So we be, have been allowed back to work officially now for four weeks. Uh, with the team's return, although admittedly most of us only part-time at the moment, 
a larger walk-in tent has been constructed with dehumidifiers helping the drying process. A full condition assessment has been made and a treatment proposal is being developed. We have, uh, we're having a custom pallet made to help, a better, help better support the statue physically and allow it to be moved safely. The damage to the sections and the weight of the bronze has seen movement at the joints and the weakened rivets over the weeks, which we need to stop. In addition, we are working with the university to analyse the various paints and wax layer to help us inform us of the best treatment method we should use before we move forward. The final decision as to where and how the statue will be displayed is still some way off. The mayor has set up a history commission which will be looking at how best to take this forward and will drive the community consultation that might surround it. While this has been, while this has been decided, we will continue to stabilise and make safe the statue so that it's ready for whatever the future holds. So the statue wasn't the only object that was documented during the day, as I discovered this magazine while cleaning. The only reason we discovered it was that was because of the loss of one of the statue's coattails, which meant that the nook where it had been hidden was now accessible. Initially, I thought it was just some rubbish that had been stuffed inside a crease in the coats because I'd already found a few sort of wrappers and, and, and um, chocolate bar wrappers stuffed into various um, crevices. Um, so, but, so at first I just tried to unroll it to see what it was. But when I saw the date, which was 1895, I, I called Ellie, who is our paper, as I said, was our paper conservative, to get some advice. And she offered to come in and treat it. Um, arriving with kitchen roll and towels in hand, again, what you had to hand at home, she then uh, carefully uh, opened it and then washed it to remove the mud and the debris. She then dried each page, manipulating the paper flat and aligning tears and creases as she went. The staples holding the magazine together were very rusted and degraded, so she will need to assess how best to repair this damage, as well as the losses to the front page, now that we have access to the conservation studios again. The paper was in surprisingly good condition, considering it had been outside for 125 years, so we think it must have been protected from water and pollut pollutants while the statue stood and only got wet when it went into the harbour. Opening the sheets revealed handwritten notes on the bottom of each page. The names on the pages were Edward Cooper, John Windsor, Charles Fox and Joseph Cope. At first we thought perhaps these were local workers in Bristol because they had used the term fitter. However, research showed us that at the time of the 1891 and 1901 censuses for Shropshire, they are listed as fitters in ironworks. They were almost certainly employed by the Colbrookdale Company, the main ironworks in the area. And that assumption had, was confirmed by the handwritten inscription inside the front cover. And we learned that the term fitter here is used to mean fabricator or assembler rather than installer. Also, in its account of the unveiling of the statue, the Bristol Mercury newspaper from, 40, uh, the, from the 14th of November 1895 reports that the statue was erected in Bristol by W. Calwin and Sons, which is a Bristol company who actually went on to build the Bristol Museum and Art Gallery building the following decade. So we know that the magazine was inscribed and inserted to, into the statue in Shropshire before it traveled to Bristol. This was such an unexpected find and one that gave um, that has given the story of the statue an additional dimension, along with the significance and symbolism of the, of the statue itself, to have this sort of uh, human aspect to kind of the actual physical statue as opposed to the symbolism of it. It, it was really nice to find, a really lovely find to, to find. So um, I thought I would also say a few things about uh, what I've learnt more broadly. Um, conserving the objects while having had their challenges during COVID um, has been a fairly simple process to, to date of minimal intervention purely because we had to make do with what we had. Um, 
I was on hand to stabilise the statue so that the real specialists were able then to treat it more effectively when she was able to return to work. The steep learning curve for me was that of navigating press and social media during a hugely significant event when treating objects of contention. I'm sure many of you use social media to great effect, but I am not a big user. Twitter, quite frankly, terrifies me. Um, but I, I really wanted to talk about the events and what the team had been doing. Um, to put my social media presence in context, I had at that point only 78 followers on Twitter, um, with a conservation tweet getting on average around three and a half thousand impressions. Um, the willingness to use social media to promote the team and conservation has always been there. I've just always been too nervous about making a mistake to use it more extensively in the past. So I put some images together and, um, and some information and ran them past the press office. Um, I should say that because uh, obviously being part of the council, we have a council press office and they were very keen to have complete control over the events that were unfolding um, to ensure that uh, the message was, was, was one of unity within the council. So we had to make sure that we really worked very closely with them. So I put this information together and um, although they were wary at first, they approved the text with a few tweaks to go out on our formal channels and said I could put things out over my personal accounts after they'd gone live. I had thought long and hard about using the BLM hashtag, um, aware that it might leave myself exposed to abuse, but also I was keen to, for a wider audience in Bristol to know what we were doing. So I did leave it in, in the end. And the response to my tweet was actually on the whole really positive. Um, people seemed genuinely interested in what we were doing, um, but it did also make a couple of things quite clear to me. Uh, the first I, was that I realized that the public perception of me as a conservator was that I would just want to make the statue shiny and new. Um, and there were tens of messages asking if we would be keeping the graffiti and a lot of happy surprise when I said that, yes, we would be because the, you know, it wasn't just a, a, a piece of public statutory anymore. It was, it was um, telling a story of the events of that day and that that graffiti was part of that story. Um, and the second was that when, was when I needed to respond to critical comments and also learning when just to leave them. Um, I surprised myself when responding, finding a tone that seemed to work to diffuse some of the more aggressive responses, but also then inform others who were truly interested in what I was doing. I think that's what had been the key thing for me holding me back was that worry of, of how, I was, how you would respond to negativity on social media. And I, um, and I was lucky that actually for me personally, it, despite it being such a sensitive issue, um, managed to navigate that okay. Um, I, I actually had to get changed earlier because I realised I was wearing the same top, which I thought would be a bit sad. So um, there are many, there are many conservators out there also who have found themselves thrust rather reluctantly into the light. Um, we are used to being in the background, quietly working away on projects, and aren't often the first people to get asked for an interview. Um, being asked to pretend to conserve something when you don't have appropriate tools working with the press office to ensure I didn't put any out any content content that contradicted the mayor's own messaging and gaining their trust so they actually asked me to do some more. It was all quite new and daunting. Uh, the interest in the conservation story certainly took the press office by surprise and although I was very worried I would say something out of place, the opportunity to talk about conservation in this context was really truly a privilege. Um, Personally, I have learned that I shouldn't be scared to talk about what we do, that I should have confidence in my choices and my methods and not to second guess myself. I was very lucky to be in a position to get involved with this project. Um, there is still a long way to go um, before we finish stabilising the objects, before we display them, um, but to have helped raise the profile of the museum and also our profession through working with such an important piece of the city's history was truly an honour. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Fran. Um, I'm just going to give me one moment yeah. and we can go to some questions. Uh, I think is Kaylee there? Yeah, I'm here. Fabulous. Do you want to um, lead with some questions? Yeah, um, thank you, Fran. I, that was just so interesting. We've got a few questions that have come up here. Um, the first one is from Judith from Brighton. Um, and she says, uh, nice to meet you and to hear about this important work. Can I ask, are you going to make the photos of placards available for general, re general use in research? And will these photos be royalty free? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I have to say that I suspect, so to, there, are, there are a lot of placards. I suspect that not all of them will be formally accessioned into our collection. Um, we have documented them all. We've already, I know that the curator has also already been contacted about using um, some of the content by other, other museums. And I would say that certainly they will be available that if they're accession, they will go on our collections online. And if they're not for commercial purposes, then they will be royalty. It will be, there would be no fee attached to that use, I would have assumed. That's fantastic. Um, I do, I have a personal, um, well, a question that I wanted to ask, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, I'll let other people <laughs> ask their questions first. Um, we've got a couple of questions here from Leslie. Um, uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to answer some of these, Fran, but I'll ask you them anyway. Yeah. Um, the first one is, uh, from whom did the instructions come, uh, come from to retrieve the Colston statue? And what was their ultimate aim regarding what should happen to the statue? So um, the instruction came from the mayor's office. Um, I think he had been advised that actually it's a working harbour um, there were already people trying to retrieve it. Um, you know, it, it was a health and safety issue as well as, you know, a political one. Um, so it came directly from the mayor's office that we, it needed to be removed from the harbour. Um, he had also been on, he had also then, I think just in one of his interviews said that if when it was retrieved, it would be going on display in a museum within the city. So that is his aim and his his wish. Um, so we are now working with him um, and the history commission he has set up to work out what that might look at like. Um, so in terms of uh, the body that is paying for the Oh, sorry, I've gone on to question two and you hadn't read it out yet. Yeah. I've, I've realised I've got them I've got them up. Um, um, so, yeah, so question two um, is which body is paying for the restoration of the Colston statue? And is the cost of restoration coming from the public purse? OK, so um, as I've said, the conservation team are employed full time by the council. It is our conservator that is working on the statue. So she's being paid, she's not being paid to do that. She is paid, she is in the employ of the council and, and is our object conservator. So there is no additional cost at present for the conservation work. Now, yes, we're having a plinth made to support the, um, to support the statue uh, in, a, in a more, um, in, in, in a better way to stabilise it because of the way that the physical uh, damage has, has occurred um, and there will be a cost to that um, but I, um, it, it will be paid for by the council either if that is via us as the museum service or by the council but um, at present I don't think any money has been spent on the preservation of it at, to date. I think that's um, what I think the a council structure conservation department is slightly different from a museum structure. So, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things that I think um, that there is a slight difference in terms of funding and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, we're very lucky because we have a conservation team within the museum. Um, otherwise, you know, yes, there would be additional cost, obviously, to get somebody in to do that work for us. But we are lucky that we have that expertise in house already. Um, so there's another question which uh, is from 
Adelheid, I hope that I'm pronouncing that right. I'm so sorry if I haven't. Um, was the missing coattail ever found? It's like a mystery novel, was it? Was it no, so, he, uh, so there were two bits that were lost on what, between it being pulled down and it making its way to the harbour. So the statue had a, um, a staff, like a walking stick, and that's gone, and the coattail has gone. Um, they probably both broke off as it came down, once it came down. I think, I think when we see footage of it being rolled, both had already gone. Um, and so far, nobody has come forward to uh, donate them. So they are lost at present. Probably in somebody's uh, garage somewhere. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> that'd be a nice find. <laughs> yeah, 20 years time, someone will, will you know, yeah. drop it off. Um, so uh, Janet Berry um, has uh, asked a question, she said, a really interesting presentation, thank you. Given the interest in conservation by the media, would you recommend media training for conservators? Yes, <laughs> I would. It's really, I mean, I think as a profession, we are so enthusiastic about what we do that on the whole, when someone asks us to talk, we can talk in a fluent and um, savvy way but what I did find quite nerve-wracking was having a press officer over my shoulder like over the other side of the camera and then people trying to who had promised that they weren't going to ask me nasty questions then just throwing that odd little question in that was more about the politics of the situation than the conservation and that's really hard because trying to say I'm not allowed to answer that question in a polite and eloquent way is quite hard and I think that that really takes practice and I think actually some training in, in to do those kind of those kind of interviews and those kind of communications um, would be really helpful um, particularly because we don't always get to be in the limelight so to be able to show off our profession in a really positive way it'd be nice to do that knowing that you're actually not looking like a bit of a prat <laughs> which I'm not sure I managed to pull off 100%, but there we are. Um, so the next question we got is from Emily, and she says, um, do you know how heavy the statue is and how are you planning to move it? So we don't know exactly how heavy it is. Um, one of the people that helped me um, when it was first removed from the harbour is our um, working exhibits coordinator. Um, he's quite used to working with big bulky things and he was estimating it was about half a tonne. So that's, so that's another reason for getting this uh, custom pallet made. So we're going to have it made so that it supports the structure where the, so basically the, the coattails were riveted on. So the one coattail that's still there, a lot of the rivets have snapped um, and areas have weakened. So we want to support it better so that it's not, it seems to be twisting slightly on its own, under its own weight. But the other reason for putting it onto this pallet is that A, we can get it weighed properly and B, we can then move it around on a pallet truck. Um, or, you know, if we need something more sturdy because it's that heavy, then something more sturdy. But um, that is the next stage. So at the moment, we're, um, we've had crates to get the plinth made and um, we're just waiting on, on availability, I think, for that to kind of start. So we have a question from Lorraine Bryant. Um, she's asked, uh, you touched briefly on challenges for your paper conservators regarding returning loans in COVID lockdown. Can you expand on that? Yes. So we had um, a loan of Belzoni drawings. So Belzoni was drawing uh, ar archaeological. It's, um, so we have a large collection of, um, so Belzoni is one and Adela Breton is the other archaeologists who were drawing beautiful representations of archaeological buildings or, or historic buildings that they found during excavations. And these were in Italy, in Padua, and they needed to return them. So we weren't, you know, nobody at this point is ready to really travel abroad. So we were like, that's fine, we'll do a, um, yeah, we'll do a virtual one. And I think the, what, what the team found was it was just so hard to, with the distance, they had just being able to say, oh, just, you know, like, for example, like, like a, if someone had a lanyard on and you noticed it was, len, len, you know, leaning in over something, being able to say, oh, oh, just, you know, do just mind your, your lanyard. 
so not only did you have the sort of obviously the language barrier but you were also having to get someone's attention because you were on the end of a of a, of a computer uh, video link and so there was so much there was quite a lot of delay in being able to um, sort of communicate your concern or, or, or your instruction. Um, we did have other, there were other careers also doing a virtual um, DRIG and who had done them before. And um, we did have it confirmed that this was a quite a chaotic one and that they had worked on much more um, smooth and calm uh, uh, sessions. But I think having it, having such a chaotic one to start with made us realize that actually you can't really, nothing is going to replace having a on-site career to supervise a de-installation or installation for particular types of objects, I think. I mean, it can work really, really well, but in this instance, it was just, it was quite hard, I think, for them. Fantastic. Um... Uh, Janet Berry has another question. Um, you mentioned that conservators are working with the History Commission. Is there a conservation presence on the commission? No. Um, so there is um, it's something that I have, I've discussed, um, mainly because when they first announced the commission, there was the, the director of Bristol, uh, Bristol Culture was on the commission. Um, but nobody who was more linked with our collections and um, sort of that side of the story. So there were lots of, the, you know, quite a lot of academics, a couple of the councillors from from the um, from the city. And I, and you know, and I was I, I felt it quite important to advocate that somebody who works with collections and understands how we can, just you know, you know, we can't just click our fingers and there'll be like a you know a BLM protests exhibition on in like three weeks time having somebody who can explain how that works and you know advocate for us in that respect was really important so the head of collections is now attending on the commission on our behalf um, which I feel much more comfortable with because it just means that he's you know it's brilliant to have um, a really broad spectrum of ideas and and um, and thoughts, but it's the practical side of things that we often have to then deal with. So um, so having that voice there to kind of just advocate for those slightly more practical aspects was really good. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Um, so we have a question here from Olivia, who has asked, uh, "Can you tell us about the ethical issues and?" discussions that arose in producing a conservation concept? Well, what's quite interesting is that I think it, there was never a, so when it, when it came to us for, for sort of safekeeping, when the mayor's office asked for us to be involved, because he knows that obviously we have the knowledge and expertise in house to help look after the, the statue. Um, it was very much seen as this is a social history object. It's not a fine art object. It's a social history object now, um, because of the fact, because of the events that surround it, and 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 because of the damage and the graffiti, and the things that had happened on that day, and the sentiment behind it. It was very much felt that this, if if this does come to us and is acquired by us, because actually it hasn't formally been acquired by us. Um, then that is because it, it would become part of the social history collection. And because of that, I knew straight away working very closely with the uh, curator of that, of that um, department that, that they, were, they very much would want to preserve as much of the history, therefore, of those events as possible. So um, the discussions in terms of uh, keeping those initial things on it, rather than just cleaning it straight away, uh, there wasn't much discussion because we that was we were all really in agreement that that is what we would do. Um, moving forward, in terms of trying to maintain those additions, um, that is going to be slightly more challenging. Um, obviously, the paint wasn't able to cure before it went into the water, which is why we're having quite a few problems now. So looking at how we manage that and the types of materials we might need to do that that might be when we have a, a bit more discussion about how 
what level of conservation restoration is required. Um, is that fantastic? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I've got a question from uh, Fabiana Patoni. Uh, she says, thank you, Fran. Great talk. You mentioned on Twitter there was an associated tyre that was placed on the statue. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. It's great. I love, I have to say, it's, it was like, when it, as it came out, the fact that this, uh, this bike tyre was hanging off the, the remaining coattail just made for such an amazing image. And yes, uh, they, well, first of all, it didn't, it went off on the barge with the statue and then when the statue was delivered into storage it had gone and actually the harbour master went off and he realised it had been left in the back of the lorry and he went back and got it for us um, and it's just really it's really nice because when you look at it once we cleaned I didn't clean it I just sort of just cleaned off just so that I could see it better um, but you could see that it obviously being on the bike <laughs> And that because it, it there was loads of rust concretions all over the around the edges of the rubber, and it was actually still in very good condition, but it must have almost rusted off the wheel of the bike, and then it got obviously got caught on the statue. So yes, so we still have it, um, and at the moment it's looking okay in terms of preservation, but um, uh, it will definitely remain with the statue moving forward, as it does the rope that obviously I had to remove at the time but we'll go back on. Did you keep the like uh, sweet wrappers and all those sorts of things that were found in all the crevices? I didn't keep those ones although he does have some some paper so he has some chewing gum up his nose which I, <laughs> I left so um because I felt that was yeah that was part of it as well so. Um, so we have um, a, uh, a question here which is um, another one that I'm, I'm not sure how you feel about responding to Fran so just uh, sort of see see how you feel. Okay. Uh, Peter Sharma um, asks um, how did it feel conserving a statue which stands for so much wrong in the world? Did you ever feel as if you didn't want to do this? I think our position as conservatives is challenging. On the one hand we are preserving history, on the other hand it's such a controversial subject. The act of the statue being pulled down and removed out of sight speaks volumes. I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Absolutely not a criticism. So that's obviously uh, quite a con controversial in itself. A uh, question and a statement from uh, Panita there. I hope I pronounced your name right as well. No, uh, uh, but absolutely, a, 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 you know, a, a completely valid question because it is, you know, that it, it has, there have, I very clearly saw on social media a, a huge polarization of, of, of opinion about whether or not, you know, should it have been taken down? If now, then it was taken down, should it be destroyed? Should it be left in the harbour? There was, you know, it was a huge amount of strong feeling. And I think for me personally, while I can absolutely understand the idea that, you know, the there is definitely an argument that it could have been left in the harbour, but I think that there were quite valid reasons why it had to be brought out, but that it can tell us, it could tell, you know, the, you know, it can tell people so much about the story of, of, of the, the protests and, and, and talk to the city and be educate, you know, be an educational tool about, what this statue meant to people in terms of not just not not just you know that individual day but what it represents for a lot of people and i think that's really important and i think that um it's hard because we've really we have really been pushing for a quick display of the of of the statue to allow um local Ristolians to come and to do uh, the previous of talking about untangible story you know intangible histories you know getting getting people's uh, feelings and opinions and and oral histories and um, talking to people about how it makes them feel to really then be able to truly say that we can interpret it in, in a rounded way when it does get displayed permanently hopefully in in, in one of our galleries um, so I didn't, I know, I didn't ever feel that I didn't want to do it, actually. I, I was proud to be part of a moment in history for Bristol that meant so much to so many people um, and that I could therefore preserve it to be able to then 
be seen by others and to be a discussion point and not everybody's going to agree with with the same position but um we have to be able to have these debates and these discussions and i think that's really important i think that's lovely what you've said there Fran. actually that you know as a conservator you're preserving a moment in history um, not just objects or paper or preventive or you know the, those categories you know preserving a, a moment in history i think that's a that's a really lovely statement to say um yeah. but, and i do truly mean it I, I i feel really quite strongly about it so yeah um, there's a third question from Leslie Primo, which I think kind of um, is sort of is mixed in with actually just um, what you've just said that about there was a plaque um, mm -hmm. that was on the statue and uh, whether it's remaining there or if that's if, and if that's going to be changed to reflect the Colston campaigners what they wanted it to say. Yeah, uh, so obviously the main plinth is still stood um where it where it was um and i think because because the statutory doesn't come under our remit we've been asked very much to look after the the bronze but we have been we are kind of that is almost as far as our remit is going to a certain extent at the moment and the history commission are very much uh going to be charged with looking at the plinth looking at what they're going to do about whether what might replace it. Um, they want to do, you know, a huge amount of community consultation on what local people feel should be there. Um, and yes, obviously, because there was so much debate and, 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 and campaigning for the wording of that plaque to be changed. And there is a lot of history around that and a lot of, um, I would say maybe I should say anger around that and the fact that they weren't able to change that um, at the time when it was being campaigned to do so. Um, so I don't I don't know to be perfectly honest. I think it's it's something that will be discussed and decided. Um, hopefully, you know, with some you know I would like to think that this isn't going to be a slow process, you know, too slow a process. But equally, they want to make sure that they get it right um, and the mayor is really uh, strongly wants to lead on that. So, yeah. Um, I'm very aware that we are rapidly running out of time. So I, I, um, I know that um, Amy has already put something in the chat box, but um, apologies in advance if we don't get round to your questions. Um, I'll try and fit in as many as we can, um, but we will get chucked out at, at eight o'clock. So um, we'll try and be quick. Uh, so Olivia asks, uh, was there any notion to involve the voices and opinions of the general public, knowing how politically loaded the statue has become, which I think you've kind of um, covered. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we kind of want to get it on display soon so that people can, can tell, you know, talk to us and tell us, you know, there is a, an assumption that people want to see it with kept with the graffiti, but is, is that actually what, they want you know we and we're not we're not tied to any one decision um it's really important for us that we we know we know th that we consult basically yeah so um the ian lacy asks um he says really interesting talk fran thank you uh, why weren't you allowed back in the room where the statue was kept for a few days was that covid related yes i mean i said i wasn't allowed i think if if i'd pressed to say i must go back and see it the next day we would have been able to provide access we would have provided access but i think we were all still quite um wary and getting to grips with our with our risk assessments with our new health and safety protocols so i think it was just felt that i couldn't really do much more um and so we did leave it i didn't you know we we were just trying to be a bit mindful of of the situation and and not um take too many risks with ourselves um and there was you know we did go back in the reason you know we went back in more regularly actually because the press kept wanting to film it which again had its whole other level of covid related stuff going on but uh, we managed to muddle our way through it thankfully so judith ricketts asks and i'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer this straight away but um can you tell me how it would be announced that photos of placards are available for use Oh, good question. I suspect um, if if there is a lot of interest that it's something that we could just tweet about once it's uh, once they're up and running. I mean, I think the problem is we haven't decided how many will be accessioned into the collection yet. So once that's gone through our acquisition kind of process, 
um, then those that then are kept will go up onto our um, our collections online and I suspect there will be some um, announcements to um, to help publicize that on our Twitter accounts um, and I do know that because they're talking to other museums about because we have so many now that I suspect the ones that maybe we don't necessarily uh, want to fully accession might might be offered to other museums I, I would I would suspect um, and I think we will also keep some as auxiliary material for displaying maybe in a more accessible way but that might not be the best preservation kind of methods so yeah just via social media that's where everything is <laughs> Um, so Louisa Coles uh, says, thank you, really interesting talk. Is there a wider team feeding into decisions about what is kept from the statue's time in the harbour and journey to it and what isn't? Is it the usual group of people which might feed into this kind of thing or is there additional interest slash input due to the high profile nature of the event? Uh, so there is a lot of interest from a broader selection of the council than would normally be there. Obviously the mayor is really interested, has a vested interest in the project. Um, and so there is, it has added another level of, of, of communication. But what I would say is that he's made it very clear that the, you know, he respects our expertise within the museum. He was, you know, while he set up the history commission, he respects that we understand, you know, we do a lot of community engagement, a lot of community consultation. We understand how to, to develop interpretations. So while there has been certain greater levels of, of, of uh, discussion, um, I would say that um, because, of, because of its high profile nature, um, it, it is more, most mostly broadly the same sort of group, but with this additional level of, I would say, sort of academic uh, input around uh, ensuring that we have the widest possible reach in terms of um, making sure we interpret things correctly. Um, so yeah, so there is a bit, there is more than usual, but I wouldn't say that we've got people pressurising us to do stuff that we don't necessarily ethically agree with. So I'll try and do just one one last quick one um, by Joe Webster. It says, um, hi Fran, such an interesting talk, thank you. I was wondering if the BLM statue by Mark Quinn that was put on the plinth is being added to your collections? Um, so actually, so the, the statue did come to M Shed to be stored, um, but it has now been returned to the artist. But actually we're in conversations with, them, with him at the moment about him donating a, a maquette to us so that we've got something that we can um, add to the collection. Um, and we're not quite sure what that, what form that might take, but I think because he's kind of already said that he wanted to auction the original sculpture uh, for charity. So, um, so he's had to had the sculpture come back, whether or not it might be deemed that we might want to fundraise to acquire it or whether if they're happy, if he is happy to give us a maquette, then I'm sure that our, um, we would, we would be looking, um, to acquire that um, but that's kind of a curatorial decision as, as opposed to mine. Okay um, so I don't know Amy is that it? Is that what we have time for? Yes I'm so sorry I, I feel like um, I feel like I, I don't know I feel like everyone probably echoes my thoughts in that I could probably just sit here and listen to questions and just keep discussing for hours it's been so interesting and I'm so sorry I have to put time on this but I guess we do have to um, let people have the rest of their evenings. Um, can I just say such a huge thank you first of all to Fran for giving up her evening and for uh, chatting to us um, and um, just having such an interesting conversation. Um, it's been fantastic and also can I say a huge thanks to uh, Kaylee for being such a great moderator and um, question asker. I think you've now got a job for the rest of our events um, and also to Siobhan for all the behind the scenes work um, that you've done. Um, thanks everyone for participating and um, also just to let you know that we have sorry um, can I just let you know that next Wednesday we also have another webinar happening um, uh, 
from the British Library, uh, Karen and Paul are talking about risk assessments during COVID and also for reopening of the collections. So please um, log on to Eventbrite and sign up for that. It's also free. Thank you everyone for participating and uh, hopefully see you next week. And I would just say if, if I missed it, if we missed any questions, if people do want to direct message me via Twitter or via my email, you know, feel free to. I don't mind answering any further questions. Amazing. And we've also in the chat box put our uh, CCG group email. So um, if you want to get in touch in any way, uh, you can do it via that and we'll be able to put you in touch with Fran. Um, yes, fantastic. Yeah. Have a Thanks, great Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.